Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Poker people, make sure you listen to episode 85, where I answered three listener questions about learning with your poker friends within a study group, my MTT opening ranges, and dealing with adjustments for bubble play. Hey, poker people, thanks for listening and for spreading the word. I'm sure you're not telling the guys at your local card room about this podcast, but I know that you're sharing it with your Facebook friends, Skype friends, and maybe even like home game buddies because our listenership grows week by week, and it's because of you, and I appreciate that. And uh, I know that you are into poker podcasts, and I just heard a great one from Tournament Poker Edge. It came out on August 4th, and it was a discussion with TPE member. Uh, his name is Chris Kusha, and he actually went very deep in this year's main event. And he talked about, or he talked all about, the big hands and the experience of going deep within the main. Uh, he credits all of his progress in MTTs to his time spent at Tournament Poker Edge, where he's been a longtime member. And this particular episode, it featured Ron Fez buddy, Killing Bird, a uh, professional and c- poker coach, Mark Alioto, as well as uh, Chris Kusha. And Chris seems very knowledgeable about MTTs. A lot of it he learned from his coaches and from TPE. Uh, he's also a live 510 cash game player, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good in itself right there. And there was some great strategy talk and MTT insights within the episode. So I really highly recommend it for anybody that's going to play in the main someday or a tournament player. Uh, or just, you know, wants to talk poker. So just search for Tournament Poker Edge Podcast in your favorite podcatcher, and I'm sure you will find it. I get mine from iTunes. So I got something special for this week's Q&A. It features questions all from one of my favorite Facebook poker discussion groups called Ace High Poker Group. John Thompson over there started a great group with currently over 2,000 members. There's people posting all sorts of things from hand histories, live and online play, cash and MTTs, live sweats like how they're currently doing in this tournament right now kind of a thing, uh, poker lifestyle stuff, and loads of other topics. Please hit them up at www.facebook.com slash groups slash ace high poker micro group or just go through the link in the show notes uh john over there will accept you in the group and you can get involved right away discussing poker and discussing strategy and when you get there tell them sky sent you So today I am featuring six questions from some awesome poker people over there at that Ace High Poker Group. Visit today's show notes at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod86 for links to everything I discussed today and to join the weekly boost for exclusive strategy or poker strategy delivered directly to your inbox. Okay, so question one today comes to us from Dan, Big Country Hudson. He asks, for new players like myself, what is the best way to get better and more experience? Online games, live games, what should I read or who to watch, i.e. Phil Ivey, etc. Alrighty, well, thanks for that question, Big Country. And there are four things that beginners should do to gain that poker XP. Number one. Start with an attitude of, I'm playing to learn, not to earn. Your goal in the beginning is to learn to play better poker with every single hand dealt. Every decision you make and every video that you watch, every poker discussion you have, and every single moment of time that you devote to studying the game. Many players start with an attitude of, I'm going to make tons of money, before they gain the necessary skills. As long as you work to improve your game a little bit every single day, the money will eventually come to you. So work to learn right now not to earn number two play a lot online i recommend to start out at the micro stakes which is up through about 10 cent 25 cent nl or you know start at the low stakes if you have a decent bankroll up through 50 cent one dollar and you want to choose a number of tables where you don't feel rushed and that you can devote enough time to make proper decisions if that's only one or two tables then so be it you'll eventually get to the point where you can play many tables but give yourself the best chance to learn by thinking through your decisions and i say to start online because with just one one table, you can put in 60 or more hands per hour. But if you're playing live, you're lucky to get in 20 hands in an hour. More hands equals more experience. Number three. 
Use tracking software like Poker Tracker 4. So tracking software allows you to review your hands after the fact. Uh, you can analyze your game and your opponent's games. You can track your progress. And the poker tracking software gives you hand histories that you can post in Facebook groups or in forums to get opinions from others. There's also the Heads Up display, or HUD, of course, that I've discussed in many podcasts before. But the HUD gives you real-time statistics on the way your opponent plays the game. You'll learn the software as you use it more and more. So at first it might seem cumbersome, might seem like there's so much stuff that it can do for you, but you know, when you use it day in and day out, it eventually just becomes a part of your game, you know, and and it will eventually become that integral part of your poker development. So if you want to learn more and even get a free trial to Poker Tracker 4, visit smartpokerstudy.com/pokertracker4. That's all one word with the number 4 at the end. Number 4. And the final recommendation I have for you is you want to develop opening ranges by position. The number of hands you should be willing to play will increase as your position becomes later. You know, for example, button range should be much wider than your under-the-gun range. Use a program like Flopzilla. It's the best program, but it does cost money. Or you can use Equilab, which is free, uh, PokerStrategy.com's Equilab. You can use either of those to decide which hands you'll open raise from every single position. Even if you don't fully understand how equity of ranges or range versus range and range versus hands, how those equities work out. Just getting started with using programs like this, it'll give you a leg up over the many people who've never heard of them. There are videos on YouTube that show you how to use these programs, and you can also find some opening hand charts online, but I would recommend coming up with your own first, playing with them, then getting feedback from others about the ranges you've selected. Alrighty, good luck, and thanks much for that question, big country. So today's question number two comes from Stephen Taylor, not Tyler, Stephen Taylor. Would love to hear others' thoughts and discussion around play during bubble time on MTTs, either live or online. I feel this can be a time to make a big change to your stack if you're willing to accept the risk reward. Well, thanks for that question, Stephen. And uh, make sure, Stephen, that you definitely listen to Podcast 85 because I do talk about opening ranges during the bubble at that time, too. So, But to expand a little bit more how your play could change during the bubbles. You're absolutely right in that the bubble is a great opportunity to run up your chip stack, but that's normally the case if you're the chip leader. As the chip leader, you can open pot after pot, three bet the medium stacks relentlessly, and just in general be a pain in everyone's ass with increased aggression. When you're at a table full of 10 to 20 BB stacks and you're sitting on 100 bigs, then this is your opportunity. It's your time to shine. But as a medium or short stack, you can't really do this. You can try if the big stacks will let you, if they're pretty nitty big stacks. But as a medium stack, you want to make the money at this point, and survival is critical. It's said that the best players play to win, and cashing be damned. But I really have to disagree with that. I say that you should play to cash, then go for the win. Cashing is the first step to winning an MTT, of course. You've got to cash before you can get onto the final table and ultimately take it down. If you take too many unnecessary risks, like shoving light into the big stack or calling off your stack just to flip for your tournament life, then you're not setting yourself up for MTT success. So with that in mind, as a chip leader, you should be bullying them around, but don't punt off your stack just to be the table captain. Be sensible in your decisions, pick on the right players, call off with good hands, and look for spots to chip up. Alrighty, thanks for that question, Stephen. So question number three from Shane Vaders. Oh, and you know that he got a ton of Vader jokes and Luke, I am your father jokes as he grew up with a last name like Vader's, you know. But anyway, Shane goes on to say, how has an open blind steal changed with the popularization of an almost any two card big blind defense? It seems the concept is a dinosaur with almost every player type defending wide. They seem impossible to get through as a steal these days. Do we still make the attempts but play a bit tighter post flop? Check the flop, but bet or raise turns to make the lines look stronger. Try from other late positions instead of the button, so the steal looks a little less obvious, etc. They do not have the effect they once did, so I've been working on approaches, and I don't feel the change in the button versus blinds landscape has been addressed all that properly. 
Okay, well, thank you for that question, Shane. And for sure, you are absolutely right. People are defending their blinds much more than ever before, as well as just fighting back out of position more post-flop with donk leads and check raises and things like that. It's good to develop some strong-looking lines for bluffing, like you mentioned, but you'll tailor the line that you use to the opponent you're up against. There isn't a single line that will work every time, as everything in poker is player-dependent. Also, I recommend keeping your steals to the cutoff, the button, and the small blind. If you're multi-tabling, you really want to make your decisions easier by sticking with mostly value-oriented ranges in the earlier positions and stealing only in the cutoff and later. If you open your hands like jack-7 suited, king-5 suited, queen-6 suited, things like that, if you open those up from every single position, you'll be running your mind ragged with all the post-flop decision-making that you're going to be forced to do at all these different tables. If you can fold those mediocre hands in the earlier position, that just saves the brain space for when you're actually doing the stealing from a steal position. One thing I would like to impress on, upon you about stealing is the bet sizing. I want you to never min steal. So we can look at the break-even math for the big blind to call a min open in a cash game. So let's say you're on the button. You make it two big blinds. He has to call one big blind to win a total pot of 4.5 big blinds. And we know the 4.5 big blinds is his two big blind bet, the small blind he folded, but that 0.5 big blinds is still in there. And then your two big blinds you put in, that's 4.5 total. So the break-even math is just the one big blind call divided by the 4.5 big blind total pot. So he only needs to have 22% equity, you know, one divided by 4.5. To think about what that means, he can call a super tight opening range of queens are better and ace king. Let's say you're not stealing, you're only value opening, queens are better and ace king. He can call you uh, with hands as bad as three deuce offsuit, nine five off, and even eight four offsuit. All of these hands have over 23% equity. So he's getting the equity there to call. Um, and so to look further at this, what about a min raise in an MTT? Well, he has to call one big blind to win a total pot of 5.5 big blinds when you throw in the antes. So all he needs here is 18% equity. He can mathematically call, no matter what you're opening with, he can mathematically call and actually profitably call with any two cards. So now you might be saying, but Sky, that's great if he calls with crap. And you're right, that is great. He's playing with a terrible hand and out of position. But... The whole idea here is you're trying to steal the blinds and antes, right? You don't have a value hand, so why offer him a good price to call? If you're on a steal, you should be making it at least three big blinds. In a cash game, he needs 31% equity, which is the two big blind call divided by the total pot of 6.5 BBs. In an MTT, he needs 27% equity, which is the two big blind call divided by the 7.5 BB total pot. Now, this isn't the biggest difference in equity needed, but the larger sizing coupled with the idea of playing out a position on later streets, that will get the big blind and the small blind to fold a little bit more often to your steals, so your steals will be more successful. And besides the break-even math considerations within stealing, you need to know how your opponents play in the blinds, or, you know, the type of opponents you're facing in the blinds. You generally want to steal versus guys who fold a whole lot, as well as guys with post-flop weaknesses that you could take advantage of. It's been said by many that the most important players to understand at any table are the two to your left and the two to your right. The two to your left are the guys that are in the blinds when you're on the button, and the two to the right are the guys that are uh, you, that have position on you when you're in the blinds. And you want to know their pre-flop and post-flop tendencies before you go stealing against anybody willy-nilly. And... It, with Whether it's cash or MTTs, if you actually know very little about them, go ahead and put them to the test and steal at every opportunity unless they show you through their actions that it isn't profitable. You know, you're not going to know whether or not you should steal or can steal against somebody until you try it. So here are some stats that will help you determine what type of players you have in the blinds. The first stat, and when I'm talking about stats, of course I'm talking about your HUD and your Poker Tracker 4 stats, or Hold the Manager, whatever you're using. So the first stat is Fold to Steal, and this is the most important stat initially to determine how profitable an outright steal is preflop. If there's 1.5 BBs in the pot and you open to 3 BBs, your steal has to work 67% of the time. If your opponents fold higher than this at a decent sample size, then every steal you make is outright profitable. The next stat is 3-bet. So the higher this is, the more likely he'll fight back against your steal attempt. Make sure you have this in a pop-up by position so you can see how often he 3-bets from the small blind and the big blind specifically. Make a plan ahead for how you will defend versus certain 3-bet percentages. 
The next stat is full to flop and full to turn C bet. So combo stat here. This will tell you how flop and turn honest they are in general. If they fold a lot on the flop, then throw out those bluff flop C bets. If they fold a lot on the turn, make sure you have enough chips to barrel the turn with implied threat on the river as well. You want to see by looking at these stats, you want to see which street they get honest on. And you got to make sure that you have the chips to barrel bluff them off on that street. Preferably with chips for further aggression later on, you know. The next stats we're going to be looking at are flop and turn donk bets. Now, you generally hit a board with something decent roughly 35% of the time. But only 10% of the time do you hit the board hard enough with something really worth bloating the pot out of position. If your opponent's flop donk percentage is anywhere roughly 10 to 12 percent or less you can safely fold all your crap hands as he's normally just doing this for value if he's donk leading with the stat over 30 to 40 percent then he's often full of it and a one and a half maybe one times raise or one and a half times raise will often blow him off especially if you've got a tighter image in general so the next stat is the flop and turn check raise. So this is a common play, kind of like the donk bet, but it's a common play where the out of position players can fight back against those guys in position. So I want you to think of these stat percentages, the check raise percentages, think of them as about the same as the donk bet percentages. And if you do so, so about 10% means they're tight. Anything over that is probably a bit looser and a bit aggressive and a bit bluffy, you know? So anything over that, You'll want to figure out a way to fight back, either or either check behind so that they can't do the check raise, or bet three bet versus their check raise. And another consideration when you're thinking about stealing, you need to think about your opponent's calling range and how it interacts with the board. If his range hits the board pretty well, then bluff C bets will be much less effective. If it's a chicken board like 6-6 six, six deuce, then your C bet will work much more often, unless you're up against a guy who calls flops liberally, maybe with two overs and that kind of thing. And because you opened pre-flop on ace high boards and even king high boards, those are pretty good ones to C bet as well, because a lot of the opponents call with a lot less stuff, and if they don't hit that top pair, they give it up. So if stealing is something that you need to work on, I would suggest, Shane, that you drop down in stakes and steal with any two cards at every opportunity. Just put yourself in as many steal positions or steal attempts as possible to see how your opponents react and give yourself some practice, you know. But don't just make it three big blinds and hit the raise button if you're doing this kind of thing, stealing willy-nilly just to get experience. You need to look at your opponent's stats first. Consider how likely your steal is to work, how you can exploit him post-flop if he ends up calling, then you hit that raise button. Focusing on these things one steal at a time, they will improve your stealing and stat reading skills. And you mentioned in your question, Shane, that there isn't a lot of discussion within this topic. But I know that it wasn't super recent, but fairly recently, Alex Fitzgerald made a great webinar called You Flat Too Much, where he discussed the late position steal and blind dynamics prevalent today and what you could do as a stealer and what you could do as a defender in the blinds. I recommend that you purchase that from him. Once again, it was called You Flat Too Much from Alex Fitzgerald. Wow, that was a super long answer. But thanks again for that question, Shane. And now for a quick Patreon plug. If you support me on Patreon before August 31st, you'll get a podcast, a video, and a webinar all about rejamming in MTTs. I'll discuss doing so for value, as a bluff, to build your stack near the bubble, to take advantage of those limp folding fish common in lower stakes MTTs, all that and a whole lot more. Supporting at the $5 level will get you the podcast for August. The $15 level will get you the video. And the $50 level will get you the webinar. Additionally, if you support at the $20 level or higher, you'll get a copy of my first ebook, which will be completed and ready by mid-September. I don't have a title just yet, but it'll be about studying poker and all the techniques I use to improve my game. So to learn more about that, uh, please visit patreon.com slash smart poker study. I appreciate you taking the time. Alrighty, back to the questions, and number four comes to us from Chaz Kearns. He says, has the game developed far beyond tag style, insofar that even in early stages, tag just isn't cutting it anymore? MTT-wise, that is. All right, thanks for that question, Chaz. Playing a tag style in MTTs, it's probably still the most common style of play. You'll see it quite often. And it's still very profitable versus all of those nits out there and those loose passive fish who are just calling stations that call down in MTTs and play very weak, uh, wide ranges. But many players have been able to take the lag approach 
approach, which is loose aggressive, they've been able to take that style of play to MTTs and be very profitable with it. I've noticed in the MTTs that I play online that it's normally the players who play lots of hands and use lots of aggressions. These are the guys that become chip leaders in most tourneys. Nits can get lucky to win tons of chips, and tags can look for great spots to chip up and find opponents willing to give them their chips. But the lags, the loose aggressive guys, those are the ones that build massive pots that they take down with aggression or through playing hands that can crack big starting hands. And one of the things, I've been reading a lot of Ed Miller lately, and one of the things Ed Miller discusses is the need to play differently from most of your opponents at the table. If you're surrounded by tags, you're better off playing a lag style and pushing them off of pots and getting extra value when they don't believe you've got something. If you're surrounded by lags, playing a tag style or even a nitty style is pretty profitable. Let them pass chips between each other, then swoop in with a great hand to snag a few big pots. So whatever style you choose, Chaz, your success will depend on how well you adjust to the players at your tables. If you make plays that take advantage of their frequency weaknesses, then you'll come out on top. By frequency weaknesses, I mean that you bet and raise versus those who fold too frequently. You fold versus players who only bet the nuts, and you stay in pots versus those who bet and bluff too frequently. Find the right opponents and use the style of play that will earn you their chips. Cuckoo. Thanks for that question, Chaz. So on to question number five. This one comes from John Thompson. He's the guy who started the Ace High Poker Group as well as is like the number one admin. He runs things currently over there. So uh, he goes on to say, any tips or formula for working out equity in multi-way pots? Thanks for the question, John. Okay, so repetition is the answer here with a program like Equilab from PokerStrategy.com. Actually, it's repetition with a purpose, and that purpose is to find the cutoffs for different situations. Cutoffs are, they're actually more than just a position at the table. Cutoffs are the hands that are profitable given your assumptions of what your opponents are playing. Any hand worse than the cutoff should be folded. So here's a sample scenario for finding the cutoffs in multi-way pots. Let's say you have 10 big blinds in the big blind. There is a cutoff guy who shoves at 12 big blinds, and the button just calls, so he puts in an additional 12 big blinds. You want to know the worst pocket pair, the worst ace, the worst king that gives you the requisite equity to call. The math tells us that there's 2.5 BBs in the pot. There's a 12 BB shove, a 12 BB call, and now we have to call 9 big blinds to win a total pot of 32.5 big blinds with a four big blind side pot that you just can't win. So we're calling nine to win 32.5. And that means that we need 27% equity, which is nine divided by 32.5. And in Equilab, what you need to do next is choose a 12 big blind shoving range, then select the range that you think would call that shove. And here's a hint. The calling range is probably tighter than the original shoving range as it should be. So I'm selecting a pretty tight 19% shoving range from the cutoff with uh, or that all that includes all pocket pairs, suited aces, ace nine off or better and most broadways. The calling range from the button, it's pretty tight at only 8% and I'm having him call with pocket sevens, ace 10 suited and ace jack off plus king queen. So versus these two ranges, the worst pocket pair with at least 27% equity is pocket sixes. Great. Now, what are the worst aces? Well, Ace Jack suited and Ace Queen off. Those both have over 27% equity. And now, what about the worst King? Well, King Queen suited has 29% equity, so that's good enough to call. But King Queen off? has only 26% equity. So it just ain't good enough. The cutoffs versus, or, you know, what we found now is that the cutoffs versus the 90% shove and an 8% call are pocket sixes, ace jack suited, and ace queen off. Great. Make this entry within your poker journal, then run another scenario. One important thing to do as well, John, is that when you're testing yourself as you run these calculations, uh, you want to make sure that you don't just start with pocket deuces and work your way up and down or start at pocket aces and work your way down start with the hand that you think is the cutoff then work down or up there based on your findings give yourself a little test here you know when i did this i thought oh pocket sevens would probably be it pocket sevens had a ton of equity and that was great so i went down to sixes sixes had it as well so i went down to fives five didn't had it so there was my cutoff pocket sixes right there so i hope that answer helps you out john and alrighty, we are on to the final question of the day this one is from richard white 
He says, or he asks, what should be your ICM thought process when looking at the pay jumps on and near the final table? John Jawanda really opened my eyes when I saw him fold Pocket King's preflop on an EPT final table bubble. Big stack on big stack with a few shorties, and he folded the Pocket Kings. Always heard go for the win, as money is top heavy, but avoiding huge flips when stacked means folding Pocket Tens to a shove even if you knew he has Ace King? Your thoughts would be appreciated. Thanks in advance. Alrighty, great question, Richard. Thank you very much. The pay jumps are definitely worth shooting for as an MTT player. Everyone should be looking to ladder up because, like you said, the big pay is up top. So the goal, of course, is to get to first place. But any increase in your pay will make your time spent more profitable as well. You know, if you can get from fifth to fourth, that's great. You need to consider the stack sizes left at your table. The player type that controls each stack and the likely range each would end up shoving or calling a shove with, that kind of thing. The nittier the player, the less likely they have a weak hand when they get it in. The looser the player, the more likely they're weak, as well as being harder to steal from, and the looser guys can call you with much wider ranges. So you want to figure out who you can steal from and who will fight back. Look to push the middle stacks around if you're the big stack, and look to chip up by shoving versus the middle stacks as the small stack. Don't attack big stacks as the small stack, unless they're super nitty, and don't don't pay off the short stack shoves too light as one of the big stacks. And what you need to do is always watch to see who's coming up on their blinds so you can get ready for some possible short stack shoving in the blinds. And when these same players, when they get through the blinds and they're still short in the button in the cutoff, you can expect for some shoving from them too when they're in late position. And you also need to consider just the size of the pay jumps. The bigger the jumps, the more important it is to you and your opponents to ladder up. If you're playing in a nightly $11 tourney, the final table pay jumps aren't that big and they are important but not as important as say you were playing an $11 tournament in a in a huge series tournament those likely have way more players than the nightly tourneys so those pay jumps are way bigger because of the bigger field so those will be more important and it's a good idea to run ICM calculations in your off time to give you a good sense of what you should be shoving and calling shoves with when you're at the tables so just like in the previous question where you find the cutoffs in different situations away from the table you want to do the same thing with ICM calculations. Practice them, understand them away from the tables. The better understanding you have, the better you'll be able to use that information when you're in game at the final table and thinking about the pay jumps. Well, that is the final question. And thank you for that one, Richard. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And thanks again to the Ace High Poker Group, as well as Big Country, Shane, Chaz, Steven, John, and Richard for all those questions featured today. I hope my answers boost your poker skills. If you're not already there, and if you're not, you're totally missing out, head over to the show notes page for everything discussed today, along with links to everything at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod86. And I love feedback, so send it to me through the show notes or you can send an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com, tweet me at smartpokerstudy, or post in the Facebook group at smartpokerstudy.com slash discuss, as well as in the Ace High Poker group. I'll probably see it there too. And please, if you have a question you'd like featured in the show, send it on through any of the channels just mentioned. Alrighty, poker people, I will be back on Tuesday next week with my first in a new series of strategy podcasts all about poker's minimum effective doses, or MEDs. It's going to be a great series, so stay tuned. And please keep telling your friends, because that's how we grow. And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to support the show for August, and for doing so, you'll get a podcast, a video, and a webinar commensurate with your level of support. The theme for August is re-jamming in MTTs, so don't miss out. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet. I